So Professor Strauman is a director of vestibular laboratory in University Hospital Zurich. Uh, he has been um, uh, around in the field for many time uh, for a long time. Has trained uh, multiple um, investigators. In, I spent some time with Dominic as well. Myself, Alexander Tarnodzer, who uh, was here last week, uh, will be uh, this week. Was with Dominic. Um, a very brilliant scientist, a smart neurologist. Uh, unfortunately, Dominic has other uh, time commitments, so he is not able to be here in person, uh, but uh, we will be happy to take questions for him and answer them as best as we can. And he's gonna talk about something very unique and very interesting uh, contractures that they had put together. Um, and uh, we will start without any further delay. Welcome to my little presentation on BPPV diagnostics and therapy using two axis turntables. A few years ago, we compared the referral diagnosis here in blue with the final diagnosis in patients that came to our center. Clearly, BPPV was the most common referral diagnosis, but after they went through our assessments, this diagnosis got even more common. If we looked at patients 65 and older, we got even more striking results. BPPV as a referral diagnosis, here again in blue, was around 20% of patients. And when the patients left our central, the BPPV diagnosis almost reached 40%. This means that a correct assessment is very important to find out the correct diagnosis, especially in BPPV. Now, the prevalence of BPPV in elderly and especially in frail patients is probably even more common. And this is because the provocation maneuvers in frail patients are not or cannot be correctly performed at the bedside. BPPV in frail patients is therefore probably more common than previously assumed. And this also applies to the liberation maneuver. It is very difficult to do a correct liberation maneuver in patients that are frail. For instance, the Epley maneuver requires quite some mobility of the back and the neck, as you can see here. If you want to go in a head hanging position, this might be especially difficult in patients that are frail. The same applies to the Simo maneuver, which is not possible if you cannot turn your head appropriately to the left or to the right. Um, of course, you can make it easier. For instance, here with the Epi maneuver, you can put a pillow under one shoulder, which helps to turn the head more to the side. But still with these uh, tricks, it, it still remains difficult to do a correct call pike and uh, after that Epi maneuver. So the canalolate provocation and liberation maneuvers in frail patients can often not be performed at the bedside in a proper way due to stiffness, pain, angst, and other reasons. And as you are aware, uh, many times the maneuvers have to be repeated in order to make the diagnosis. And this puts even more strain on the frail patients. Um, one difficulty is when you tell them to do the self repositioning maneuver, for instance, the Epley maneuver, that there is a danger that they fall from the bed. Therefore, we sometimes recommend the so-called Foster maneuver, 
which can be done on the floor. Um, it's also called the half somersault one over. It's, it's certainly less dangerous than the epri maneuver on the bed, but still you need some mobility of your back and your neck to perform the Foster maneuver correctly. So already John Epley had the idea to do the provocation and liberation maneuvers on a turntable, which puts much less strain on the neck and the back of patients. So we agree that the canal lit provocation and liberation maneuvers in frail patients are best performed on a three-dimensional turntable. And we uh, showed this uh, a few years ago in a, in a case of a 96-year-old patient that was afflicted with BPPV. And we diagnosed and treated her on a motorized three-dimensional turntable. And I want to show you the video. Uh, first, in uh, fast motion, what we did. Um, this is the Epley maneuver. And now we show you the cartoon of the position of the chair together with the binocular registration of the eyes. And here you can see this typical upbeat nystagmus in the torsional vertical direction. And since the patient is in a head hanging position, this is a geotropic nystagmus. Now we do the Epley maneuver, fast forward. And after the maneuver, we perform the whole pike maneuvers, the so-called whole control whole pike maneuver, which shows us that we had treated the patient successfully on this motorized turntable. So we had, over the years, we had a lot of experience with uh, using this turntable, um, which can be rotated about three axes. And uh, since 2013, we did uh, diagnostics. Uh, we also found that right-sided posterior canal lithiasis is a little bit more common then left side is canalolithiasis or bilateral canalolithiasis. We also diagnosed lateral canalolithiasis and anterior canalolithiasis. Some patients uh, didn't receive uh, the diagnosis of a BPPV after they were on the turntable for diagnostic purposes. This is another example of a measurement on a, a turntable. And here, interestingly, is to show you that sometimes you have to perform the whole pike maneuver twice. And that's what we always do. Also at the bedside, we repeat every maneuver on each side twice. This was the first whole pike maneuver. And uh, clearly there was no typical Nystagmus only, you had the nystagmus during the movement, which is, of course, physiological. Now, when we repeated the whole pike maneuver in the same patients on the same side, five minutes later, this is what we saw with a latency of a few seconds. You see now a relatively violent, geotropic, vertical torsional positional nystagmus. So this is just to show you that sometimes it's a very good idea to repeat the provocation maneuvers at least twice, especially if the history of the patients suggests a PPPV. Another example that we could record on the motorized turntable is a posterior canalitis in a patient and he had a very, very long latency, as you can see here. And this shows you that you sh really should 
wait long enough, sometimes almost a minute. So this is was at 50 seconds, a relatively strong positional nystagmus appeared. Sometimes, of course, we also saw lateral canalitis or cupulolitis. This is a case of a apogeotropic lateral canal or cupulolitis. Clearly, in this case, the nystagmus beats apogeotropic in the horizontal direction. And when we switch to the other side, so-called supine roll maneuver, the nystagmus changes direction after a while, as you can see here. The challenge for the clinician, and this is especially difficult if you don't have video recording, is to determine which side has less nystagmus. And for this, you have to wait long enough and also repeat the provocation maneuvers, in this case, the supine roll maneuver. We also did treatments on uh, the motorized turntable. We performed Epley maneuvers on the right side or the left side. Um, in some cases, we went for somersaulting in the backward direction. So after the whole pike position, we just continued the rotation in the plane of the affected canal very slowly until the patient reached the upright position again. In some cases, we did somersault forward. This was especially the case in patients with anterior BPPV and for patients with um, horizontal BPPV, we did either ro log rolling or we also started the Gufoni maneuver. So this is how we do the whole pike and the Epley maneuver. And we sometimes, and this was uh, possible with the motor, uh, sh did some shaking in the head hanging position. So this is a case of a patient before the Epley maneuver. So now it's being moved in the 30 degree head hanging position. I think it was on the right side. And again, with some latency, a nystagmus appears. And this is the whole pike after the Epley maneuver, where we clearly see that the nystagmus does not appear anymore. So for the posterior canalolitis, we did mainly the Epley maneuver and a little more uh, rarely the, the somersault backward maneuver. Now, motorized turntables are very rare and they are expensive. And therefore we were thinking about uh, helping uh, to develop a turntable that would be uh, have the same possibilities of liberation or provocation of BPPV, but it should be manually driven without a motor. We figured that three axes are not necessary, two axes are enough. It should be possible to operate the machine by a single user. The turntable should be mobile and transportable. It should be relatively low in cost. 
It should be optimized for the patient's comfort and it should allow either low-tech recording of eye movements with Frenzel goggles or high-tech with infrared video oculography, just depending on the needs of the clinician. And uh, this is the two-axis manual turntable that was constructed by a company for us. And um, it, it allows, as you can see, to rotate the patients in the yaw axis and on this circular track in the roll axis or depending on the position of the inner axis in the pitch uh, plane or in any plane between roll and pitch. So this is what you need for the provocation and liberation maneuvers of PPPV patients. And uh, uh, the, um, the, the trick is that the center of mass of the patient is in the center of this track. And if you can manipulate, move the patient in such a way that the center of mass will be in the center of the track, you don't need a lot of force to move the patients in, 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 in this direction. Importantly, we need always 360 degree, uh, degrees possibility to rotate around because sometimes we want to liberate a semicircular canal by doing the whole 360 degree rotation. Um, the idea was that we would go with this turntable to resident homes, nursing homes, and apply these to patients that complained of vertigo. And uh, this is actually what we did. Um, we went to 10 different nursing homes and this was our, our Schwindelbus. And uh, with the Schwindelbus, we transported the turntable to the nursing homes and um, applied it to the patients, as you can see in this video here. So the patient first is being seated in the turntable and then various straps are being applied. We put the patients in the different provocation maneuver positions. And if we see that they have a vertigo together with a positional nystagmus, we apply the appropriate liberation maneuvers. Now, what we saw is a point prevalence around 10%. So here you see the number of patients that had uh, BPPV in parentheses. Sorry. Here you see the point prevalence of BPPV for all 10 nursing homes. And in parentheses, you see the number of patients that were investigated on the turntable. These data points show you the prevalence for each different nursing home. And we found a mean of a point prevalence of around uh, 10%. So that means that at one point during the year, uh, the prevalence of BPP is around 10%. And if you assume that the duration of BPPV is not the whole year, but a, a restricted amount of time, then you can uh, compute the yearly prevalence, which will go probably higher than 30 degrees among uh, these patients. But of course, we didn't test that. We only tested it at one point in time. 
So how do we perform the whole pike maneuver? This is the pike maneuver on the right side. We usually go to a 30 degree head hanging position. And here you see the whole pike maneuver on the left side. We always observe an enlarged video of the eye on a, a tablet, which is mounted to the inner axis of the turntable. Now, here is the provocation maneuver for horizontal canalolithesis or cupololithesis for the right side. And here for the left side, again, we are closely observing the tablet for eye movements that would indicate that uh, the horizontal canal is affected by cannula or cupololithesis. This is the therapy, fast motion, Epley maneuver. In this case for the left side. And we usually do that in 45 degree step and wait long enough at each position. And now the patient is being put upward. Always we do a whole pike maneuver for control, as you can see here now. We sometimes also do the sumo maneuver, which is also easily being done. Uh, this is the sumo plus maneuver which has been advocated by Michael Strupp in Munich. That means you have to go 30 degrees below the horizontal plane to make sure that the canola lights really leave the posterior semicircular canal. And again, we do a whole pike maneuver for control, as you can see here. Okay, let me sum up. BPPV in frail patients is probably more common than previously assumed because the maneuvers cannot be performed correctly at the bedside. And this is because the frail patients are low cost. Thank you for your attention and have a good meeting. So, um, great. So I got two questions here. Um, one question is from uh, Zuma. What is uh, a result? What is your result with lateral canal BPPV apogeotropic variant with your 3D turntable performing euphony maneuver? Uh, so, um, uh, Zuma, I know. Uh, I think this is the this is the question that Dominic can answer the best. So, what I will do is I will uh, forward it to Dominic, and at some point, if others are interested, they can let us know, and we will uh, post the answer to that question if that is okay. Uh, and the second question is from Adolfo. What is the reason behind nystagmus uh, on the second Dix Hall Pike, but not the first? Uh, so again, um, I think Dominic would be the best uh, person to answer both of these questions because I think they are very specific to what his results were. Uh, unless someone knows uh, the answer, uh, had communicated with Dominic in past. Uh, we have. Um, uh, we have uh, we have another question which is coming from um, Dr. Molly Krishna Kanda. What is the role of beta histine in BPPV? Is it universal answer for all verticals? Um, well, in the in United States, we don't get beta histine, uh, so I don't have much experience with that. But those who do, uh, hopefully, will be able to address that answer. Uh, any anyone who can answer that question? We generally don't do beta histine in the United States. So I don't have experience with that. Looks like no. 
Um, well, um, so I will also forward your question to uh, Dr. Straman and um, um, if you would like to send me your email address, I will forward it to you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Sergio, do you have anything to say? Oh, no, I am back. Oh. Um, just... oh, okay. okay, okay. Yeah, no, he was wondering whether beta histine has any specific role. So that's why I was, um, I don't use beta histine for BPPV or anything because we don't get it. So. Okay, great. 